Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here today. Let's stand together. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing sing it out Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Thanks so much for coming to church today. We're glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, I hope that you've already been made to feel welcome. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Our prayer is that everything that's sung, everything that's said, would be of encouragement to everybody who's here. Now, that's a big task uh, to do that for everybody, but God has a way of doing that when we come together in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, we're going to take about... They make fun of me for saying this, but it's about 40 seconds. Uh, and greet those near you and make sure that they have been welcomed to First Baptist this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you that in your plan for the world, 
you didn't leave us alone, uh, but that you put us in a, a church. You save us by your grace and then let us be a part of a church. And it's where we can share life together. We can be encouraged by singing together. We can be encouraged by hearing your word and just the smiles and the lives of other people. Thank you for all the relationships you give to us. I realize that in a congregation this large that there are people who are hurting today. Some people, it was all they could do to get here. Uh, help them know that that's okay, that they are loved unconditionally by you. And for those that are on the mountaintop this morning, I pray that that joy you're giving them would just spread to others and that you would use us to build each other up. We would rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And uh, that your will would be done through everything that takes place this morning. Love you, and thank you for letting us be here this morning. Amen. All right, now make those near you welcome. is rising.
see is when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away.
cast my mind to Calvary. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his senses free. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down. sun shall pierce the night and I will near this time when we remember your ministry on earth, culminating in your death on the cross and your burial in the tomb. Let us rejoice together in your resurrection as the stone was rolled away and the Son of Man came forth triumphant over sin and death. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I was raised on five-pound candy uh, that my grandmother Funkhauser made. I have no idea why she called it five-pound candy, other than if you ate enough of it, I guess you could put on five pounds uh, pretty easily. Uh, I wanted the tradition to continue when I had my own children. My, my grandmother uh, was in a nursing home and uh, had uh, issues for a few years before she died when I was just a young father uh, at the time. So I got the recipe, and I 
uh, learned how to cook it. You cook it to a softball stage, and then you let it cool for a little bit, and then you beat it mercilessly with a wooden spoon uh, for an extended period of time, and then there comes a point when it goes from being glazed over to becoming dull, and when it gets dull, then at that point you better get it in a buttered Pyrex dish or it's going to all set up and it'll be all for naught. And so it just, it just seems like it's wasting time, wasting time. And that's why I have a bigger right arm than I have a left arm now from beating on that candy uh, with a wooden spoon. But then it all came together right at the end and it was definitely well worth it. Jesus Christ showed up uh, in the world, born of the Virgin Mary. He was raised in Nazareth. He made his public appearance. Uh, when John the Baptist baptized him, he does all these miracles. He teaches. He uh, tells people that there's going to come a time when he's going to lay down his life. He'll be raised again. And then when it all came together, it came together in a hurry. You go from the triumphal entry on Sunday to his resurrection on the following Sunday just in the space of eight days. Everything that he came for the purpose of doing took place all at once. It just happened in a, in a very rapid amount of time. And so that's why in the next three weeks, I'm going to look at Palm Sunday, Black Friday, and Resurrection Morning as we look at three of those eight days as what happened during the time. Now, I'll confess, uh, I didn't realize that calling the sermon today Palm Sunday was going to be such a problem for so many people. I actually was kind of refreshed yesterday. I was talking to my mother. She, uh, she oftentimes, when I talk to her on Saturday, she says, are you ready for tomorrow? And I always say, I will be. Got to go over it another time tonight and in the morning, and then it'll be ready to go. And then she'll say, what, what are you preaching on? And so I told her, I said, Palm Sunday. And she said, it's not Palm Sunday tomorrow. And so first of all, I thought, yep, she's 87, but she's still sharp. So then I explained to her, it's not Palm Sunday, but I've got... And then the hearing was a challenge. And anyway, I, so I thought that that was just my mom. But then I show up to church this morning. There are several people back in that area. I won't name their names, but you can look back there. It's a blue shirt, the uh, striped deal. You know, and they're all like, what is today? That's, it's not Palm Sunday. Well, what are you doing preaching Palm Sunday? Well, I, <laughs> Some of you just need to go to seminary, get your own church, and do it however you want to do it. Uh, so anyway. I'm going to quit being creative and just do like I saw it when I was being born. Just a preacher get up there and open the Bible and say, well, let's just read here and I'll just talk a while. It's okay. So, Actually, one of the reasons I'm doing this, I don't know that I've ever preached much on Palm Sunday before and I want to do it, so we'll do it. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. It is the Sunday before Jesus goes to the cross on Friday and is raised the next Sunday uh, from the dead. And he's going towards Jerusalem, and this is how things uh, happen. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. From Zechariah 9.9. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the, uh, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest and or in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he stirred all the crowds up. And I think that in this, we see just this reaction that the people had in mass there in Jerusalem over the Passover celebration week, uh, that still today, that when Jesus shows up, he requires a decision. 
And we have to be for him or against him. He stirs everything up, and he did that here. And in this particular passage, in these 11 verses, there are three expectations that God has of us that we see on display here. Three expectations. First of all, God expects faith. God expects faith. It tells us in Hebrews that without faith it's impossible to please him because he who believes in him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who uh, believe in him. We have to, without faith, you can't please God. And in this particular case, we see these shouts of, of faith that these people have, that this is the coming Messiah, this is the one that God has sent, that he is the son of David, that he is, uh, he is the one who is coming. And then they respond in such a way that they are responding in faith, even though they don't understand everything that's going on. They're doing what Jesus asked them to do and responding in faith. And God expects faith. He expects obedient faith. Uh, faith is more than just what you know in your head. Faith is an action that is taken. Uh, our obedience is an evidence of the reality of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Here we see in these, this particular case uh, that the two disciples that are unnamed, but Jesus says, go to a city, to a village ahead of you, more, more than likely Bethany, which was located nearby. Go there, and you're going to find a colt, and you're going to find a mare, and you bring them both to me. And if anybody says anything to you about it, then you just tell them the master has need of them. They'll let you have them, and you come back here. And it says, in response to that, it, just, it says that, that, that they did as Jesus had directed. It doesn't tell us who these two disciples are. Sometimes in the scriptures it does give us the names of those. But I think it doesn't tell us the two names because whoever of the, of the twelve it was... They all had learned by this point to obey. Do what he tells you to do. Uh, obedient faith. And in our lives, there is the, when we trust Christ as Savior, it's because God has told us that uh, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ on the, our Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe. That's a commandment. Do that. And so we do that. Even though there's a lot of things we don't understand at that time, we do know that we are to obey. And if we obey, then we receive salvation. And then after that, uh, when he tells us to do something, even though we don't know everything uh, about it, we obey. Obedient faith. God expects faith. Obedient faith. He expects us to do what he asks him to do, whatever he asks us to do. Some of you were raised by parents that when you ask them about something, uh, then why, why should I do this? You, they simply said, because I told you. And you've raised your, your own kids at a certain level the same way. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. When they're three years old, they don't understand that a car is coming down the road and you probably ought to get over here. It's not a time to reason with an unreasonable person. You just tell them. And then they are to obey, and then later on they get to fill in the gaps. Same way in our relationship with God. What is the full significance of this belief? And what does this all mean? And how do I need to, you know, don't overthink it. Obey. And so God expects, expects faith, obedient faith, trusting faith. That is, that, that, that you trust that all is going to go well when you are forsaking all and trusting him. Then when I am yielded to him, then it's going to be okay that I trust him. Uh, there are a lot of details that these two disciples did not know when they went to this village. And there, I mean, there was no GPS for that. Mayor and Colt standing by the side of the road. Uh, you couldn't tap. I mean, it's like they're just walking and they're going to find out the details later. And they're just trusting that Jesus knows what he's talking about. And it's good, they're going to be able to find him and bring him back. Uh, in Luke's parallel account of this in chapter 19 of Luke, it says that as Jesus came up over the hill and he saw Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem because he could see the coming judgment at the hands of the Roman government, which actually took place uh, in 70 A.D., that he saw ahead of time what was going to happen. And the point is this. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is everywhere. You can trust him. And he expects us, as we live by faith, to trust him, trusting faith, that we do that. 
And I understand all of us have things that, that surprise us in life, that we don't understand in life, but the overarching reality is God expects us as his children to live and trust. We trust him that he's in control, and no matter what happens, we, he wants us to do that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so don't talk yourself into saying, well, since I don't understand all the future, and th since this happened to me that wasn't there, and since all this happened, then I, I just don't think there is a God, and I don't care about God. No, you, he expects faith. He expects obedient faith, not perfect obedience. We all sin, but a faith that will do what he asks you to do and that continues to trust him through all situations because he, he really is God. He really is in control. He really can be trusted with your life. Uh, when I go swimming in a cold swimming pool, or I mean, it feels cold like this time. I wouldn't go this time of year. Uh, but... My theory on that is go to the deep end and jump in. Just get it over with. My wife's theory is wade in a little at a time and go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, do not tell her I said that. That isn't going to be in the next, next, next week, our sermon. So just anyway, so, but anyway, but she does. Uh, we, a few years ago, we went to uh, Portland, Maine, and the Atlantic Ocean is cold any time of the year, or I found that out. Well, we, I got out in the water, and my old theory of just get it over with, and that, that wasn't a good theory. And uh, she kind of inched into it a little bit, and then she just got out and didn't get in. Sometimes that'll happen to you when it comes to faith. Go ahead and trust God. Go ahead and get all in with Jesus. Forsake all and trust him. Because if you just start inching in a little bit at a time, and you, it isn't going to happen. It's, he requires all in. That doesn't mean you don't ask questions. It doesn't mean that you don't have conversations. It just means that when, it comes, when push comes to shove, you've got to trust Jesus. And you, it, he expects faith, Tr uh, obedient faith, trusting faith. Secondly, we see here that God expects praise. God expects praise. Um, when Jesus shows up, all of these people are around him. I read accounts that said during the Passover week, there were upwards of two, two and a half million people would come into Jerusalem from all over the world. Uh, and so there's lots and lots of people. And as he comes into the city, uh, they are giving this praise. They're saying Hosanna, which means to save now. And blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, blessed is the son of David. Uh, they're, they're quoting from Psalm 118, and they're, they're giving praise to Jesus. And when they do that, Jesus doesn't say, hey, settle down now. Simmer down. Don't say anything. It'd be better if you didn't do that. Keep, you know, these people had not rehearsed a Palm Sunday uh, celebration. This is a spontaneous act of giving praise uh, to, to Jesus, and he lets that happen. What God wants of us is uh, lips that give praise to him. I read that in Psalms this morning again, that he doesn't want sacrifices. He wants people that are sincerely uh, thankful for all that he had done. And Luke's, again, Luke's parallel account in chapter 19 of Luke uh, the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, S -s -s tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, well, if they aren't going to give me praise, then the rocks are going to cry out. Kind of makes you wish Jesus would have told them to be quiet so the rocks could cry out. But, I mean, he's, it's going to happen. Jesus and God, God loves it when we tell him thank you. Remember when Jesus healed the ten lepers and the Samaritan came back and said thank you, and Jesus said, that's great, but uh, wasn't there, weren't there ten I'm counting right, there were ten, and only one came back to say thank you. And so God expects praise, sincere praise. That is, he wants us to praise him uh, from the heart, not because we have to, but because we get to. Uh, praise includes singing, but it is not limited to singing. Praise is the giving of thanks to God. So that we sincerely, as we live day by day, are counting our blessings and we're telling God thank you for the things that he has done in our lives, the things that he has given to us, and that that's a natural thing that happens because of, of, uh, of what he's done. He, it makes him happy that we tell him thank you. Uh, when we come together as a church, we, we sing. We sing together. And it's something that pleases him when it's sincere, when it's not something that's fabricated, but something that comes uh, from our hearts uh, because we want to, not because we feel like we have to. Um, we, uh, we we got this deal going on the, the Passion Week this year uh, 
Allison Kendall, uh, Brennan uh, King, and I went out and sang five different hymns, the first and last, about the cross. And uh, we're going to post those Monday through Friday. Brennan will do that. But we wanted to go out and sing in front of uh, Les and Lori Crawls. They're behind their house. There's this big cross back there. And I called him and said, now, be okay. We'd go out there and sing in uh, front of that cross, you know, with that in the back. And he said, yeah, that'd be okay. Just don't scare the cows. <laughs> so, so. I guess he wasn't very confident of our ability to sing, uh, but whether you're confident in the ability or not, it's from the heart. One of my best friends can't carry a tune in a bucket. I hope he gets transformed by, in heaven so he can participate. If he doesn't, it's, he'll be listening then. He's, he's never sung in his life just because he can't. Uh, but, uh, there's this, but there's something about being grateful to God, and I'm, I'm not one that rides emotions, and I don't think you should be either. They're great companions, but terrible masters. But, man, when you're feeling it and you're grateful for what God has done, you need to let it rip, whether you're in the car or whether you're in church, wherever you are, just to tell him thank you because it pleases him. Sincere uh, praise that we give. Uh, Charles was already dead by the time I moved to Toka. But his uh, widow, Johnny, told me about one time when they were in church and Charles was, uh, he was just singing really loud and she said she nudged him and said, Charles, you're singing too loud, you need to be quiet. And uh, Charles responded and said, I just can't help it. God's been so good to me and I've got to tell him thank you. And that's the, that's the thing he's looking at from us is this sincere praise. God expects praise, sincere praise, biblical praise. That is not just to be loud, but to sing things, say things that are based on what the scriptures teach. Uh, as they sang out, to, they called him the son of David, which referred to him being the Messiah. Uh, that they weren't just making noise, they were praising him based upon their knowledge of what, who he was and what he had come to do. As I mentioned earlier, they were quoting Psalm 118 when they uh, said that he was coming in the name of the Lord. That, that's right out of the Bible. Um, when we praise God as a church and when we sing, almost everything that we sing, everything's based on Scripture. A lot of what we sing is, comes right out of Scripture because it's based upon the reality of the facts of the Word of God. And so biblical praise, that we, we're not just cranking up Fleetwood Mac or whoever else nowadays uh, just to sing to sing. It's, it's based upon the reality of what the Word of God teaches. Uh, and when you read the Word of God, uh, you are stimulated for giving thanks to God for things you're reminded of as you uh, read the Scriptures. Uh, Nancy and I were talking the other day about how advantageous uh, it is. We both journal. We'll write down a verse that we read uh, in our reading and just how that helps us to rem remind reminds us of something that we are giving thanks to God for. And so as you read Scripture, you give back thanks to God for what He has done. Because God expects faith, God expects praise, and finally, God expects humility. God expects humility. H humility is when you, is a personal choice. Circumstances in life can come that should make you humble, but your, your humility is a personal choice. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God as a matter of personal choice, or it doesn't happen. And here we have illustrated Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the Sunday before he goes to the cross. He's mounted, he's humble and mounted on a donkey. And from, from uh, the Old Testament, this was a, an illustration of the fact that he, as the Son of God, is humble. And that he expects of us to be humble as well. It's an argument from greater to less, that if Jesus is the Son of God lived a life of humility, he humbles himself, then we as his followers also, he expects of us that we would be humble in everything that we do, that God expects humility. Uh, humility is when you do not make life about yourself. Humility is when you love God and you love other, others, you serve God and you serve others, and it, that's, that's what he expects. He expects humility from every disciple. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. 
It tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that he humbled himself, became, he was born as a human, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross, and therefore God highly exalted him, and that he set the example. And every believer is to live a life of humility in your relationships in your home, in your relationships at work, in your relationships in the church, that we are to humble ourselves so that we don't make life about ourselves we make life about serving God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Um, and that is true uh, for each of us as we live day by day. I have heard through the decades as a pastor about people that they'll qualify people and they'll say, now, uh, she or he has a strong personality. And it's almost become like an excuse for people that never really humble themselves. So, but anyway, I checked in the fruit of the Spirit, and it says love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, strong personality, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, that, that doesn't have those ten. It just has nine. It doesn't have strong personality. Um, now, humi- humble does not mean weak. Humble does not mean no opinion humble means choosing to make more of others for the sake of Jesus and he expects that of all of us and if we all live as if we if we fulfill the humility that God expects of us it would make every marriage better it would make every relationship with friends better it would make everything in all of life better because when you end up and have stress and conflict it's when people begin to want to spotlight themselves and their opinions and their needs and their, you'll make life about them. And the reality is that God expects humility from every disciple from now on. And by that, what I mean is humility is not a pathway to greatness in the kingdom of God. Humility is greatness in the kingdom of God. On the way to the cross, Jesus is going to tell the disciples. You know, the disciples are going to be arguing about who's greatest. And he's going to say, uh, the greatest among you will be your servant. And then on the Thursday following this, he's going to illustrate for them humility by washing all of their feet uh, uh, when they have the Passover meal together. From now on, the great position in the kingdom of God for me, for you, for everyone, is humility. That... I lead by serving. You lead by serving. You strengthen your marriage by serving. You raise your kids by serving. You interact with others by serving, by humbling yourself. Die to yourself that you might be able to live in service of others. And so, uh, there it is. Your, uh, the expectations that God would have of us. God expects faith. God expects praise. And God expects humility. That's our job description. Personnel meeting uh, a couple of months ago. One of the great things about, many great things about this church in my opinion, we have a lot of strong, wonderful, humble people who serve on various committees and have throughout the I can even say decades now. I've been here over two decades. Uh, the constant great leadership. Well, we have a new head of personnel. Joe Bryant's the head of personnel. And uh, he had written out this great agenda and all these things. And uh, uh, then he had, he had listed the PD. And uh, someone said, um, what's a PD? And I said... And I popped off. And I said, oh, that's the personal, just, anyway, I didn't even know what it was. And then Joe said, uh, no, that's your, that's the position description, not a job description, position description. So I stuck my foot in my mouth, uh, but he was very kind. He just smiled like he didn't know what he was talking about, but he's the preacher, so I can't say anything. Uh, So, but, so here's your position description. 
your job description. What's God expect of you? He expects faith. No matter how hard it gets, you keep looking to him. You may not know how things are going to work out, but you're, you're looking at him. He expects praise. When you're in the, on the mountain and when you're in the valley, that you're going to praise him and that gives pleasure to him. And then he expects humility. That's the only way any relationships work in all of life is he expects humility. This morning, this happens every time. I'll, I'll walk my dogs, and then they're never satisfied. So about 30 minutes later, they start banging on the window again because they think this may be a day we either get to go hunting or he's going to take us out there and let us run. And Freckles did it again this morning. He, I walked him in the dark. It's time to go to church. And I scratch and banging on it. And uh, I had the thought. I need to be like that with God. The word Hosanna here, it means save now. Save now. I believe very strongly in the sovereignty of God, but I don't want to believe it in it so strong that I quit asking him. And I had these kind of thoughts. I thought, God, we can't. We, we don't need another spring and summer like we had last year. We need some rain. And I trust you completely, but, but before, before we have another one like that, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do it and let it happen while I'm banging on the window. I need some rain. And maybe my friend won't become a Christian, but I'm, I'm not going to let that happen while I'm just sitting in my recliner not saying a word. I'm going I'm to keep knocking. I'm going to keep asking. Maybe, maybe things aren't going to work out the way that I thought they would in certain situations. But I'm going to die asking you to intervene. Save now, Lord. Send some rain. Would you save my friend? Would you help my family? Would you intervene, God? I can't do it. I'm imp it's impossible for me to do it. But you can. And so I want to be like that. I want to be like that widow and that Jesus told about. He told the I read that last week, the parable where he taught us to always pray and never give up. And she's just banging on the door of a people to give her some bread in the middle of the night. And so as we conclude, I'm going to pray. If you need to visit with me, I'll be here at the front. You can come during the final song and visit with me. I'll be over there after church. Or if you just want, if you want to mark on a card, you want to talk to me sometime, just mark it and put it in a box on the way out, and I'll contact you. But I'd like for some of you, during our final song, to come and I'm not much of a kneeler at a step anymore. I'm, I can't get up much. Uh, but you can come and stand, sit, kneel if you're young and agile, and just. Hosanna, save now, God. Would you intervene in this situation, whatever it is? You pray for somebody else. You may want to pray for yourself. But you feel the freedom to do that as we sing our final song together. Let's stand for prayer. God, we cry out to you to save now, to save our land to save relationships, to save marriages, to save souls, to save... The longer we live, the more we realize that we can't make change happen. But you can. And so that's why we cry out to you. We don't mean to be a bother, and I know we're not a bother, but you long for us to ask, and we're going to do that now. And I pray that as we cry out to you, you would hear and you'd respond and we will give you the praise for what you do. Amen. I'll be here at the front. You feel free to come and ask for whatever you want to ask God uh, to intervene.
Good morning, church family. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Hey, if you lead a D group or are interested in leading a group D group, you're going to want to be here tonight at five o'clock for the D group round trip. There's going to be some excellent information that you're going to want to have as you talk about and share ideas with others. So tonight, D group round table, five o'clock. Also, Wednesday, we're going to be celebrating Good Friday. Good Friday on Wednesday. Earl's going to be doing his monologue. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be, you guessed it, incredible. 
So don't miss Earl's monologue when we celebrate Good Friday on Wednesday. Also, if you're interested in being baptized on Easter, we would love for you to do that. That'd be a great time to get baptized actually on Easter morning. And so if you're interested interested in doing that, come and talk with one of the staff, Earl, Brennan, Seth, myself, McKylan, uh, Tamara, anybody, come talk to us and we'd love to get you set up and get you baptized. Hey, remember as you go to abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build his church and go make disciples.